Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we are going to, going to get into the Decembrists by Epic History, who were Russia's first revolutionaries. This is a, a time period that's kind of showing the buildup into, well, when the real revolution and overthrow of the government will take place. It's not the first revolutionaries of that era. It's the beginning of this, right? It's the beginning of the, the kind of push towards these, these changes. But honestly, you could go back even further than this. I think, golly, by the time Alexander takes over, I want to say the last two or maybe even three No, at least the last two czars had been killed, I believe. I think that's right. Um, so you could go back further than this, but this is real organized like push for change. So I love Epic History. I think their videos are awesome. I want to get into it and see what they have to say. Let's do it. The Decembrists. 1815. At the Battle of Waterloo, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte suffers his final defeat, and two decades of war in Europe come to an end. The victorious powers, led by Austria, Britain, Prussia and Russia, meet at Vienna to decide the fate of Europe. The frontiers of nations and empires are redrawn, while Emperor Alexander of Russia adds King of Poland to his list of titles. He also oversees creation of a holy alliance to ensure that no more revolutions threaten Europe's established order. The Russian Empire, after many great sacrifices in the wars against Napoleon, emerges more powerful than ever. But not everyone in Russia is pleased with the new state of affairs. A group of young army officers dream of a different future for Russia a new form of government, radical reforms, even a Russia without a Tsar. And we've talked about this in other videos, the Napoleonic Wars and French Revolution. It's not just a French thing. There is widespread change happening and widespread push for change. So it makes its way to Russia, right? And that makes sense even without the Napoleonic Wars, that would make sense. But with the Napoleonic Wars, you have huge amounts of soldiers and officers that have been in Europe, right? They have seen these pushes for change firsthand up close. And so it's, it's similar to the uh, Lenin idea in World War I of the Germans don't want him to talk to anybody that is not Russian, right? They, he can go to Russia, he can start his revolution in Russia, but don't talk to anybody in Germany. Uh, we do not want that fire spreading here. Well, the, the soldiers and officers have been in Europe. They have seen that fire burning there. And so when they go back to Russia, they want to take it there, right? This video is sponsored by NordVPN. These days more and more. If you're worried all this might slow down your connection, speed NordVPN for sponsoring this video. In 1812, Napoleon had invaded Russia with the largest army Europe had ever seen. It was a defining moment in his reign but he underestimated Russian resolve. In Russian weather. Four months later, the remnants of his army began its infamous retreat from Moscow. The Russian army and its coalition allies then drove Napoleon's forces back across Europe, fighting giant battles in Germany 
and finally arriving in the streets of Paris itself. Napoleon's abdication was a moment of triumph for Emperor Alexander and for Russia. For many young Russian officers, it was also an eye-opening experience. That's hilarious. For Russian officers, it was an eye-opening experience. Look at those pictures. They have something in common. Imperial Russia was an autocracy, ruled by an emperor with no checks upon his power. There was no political opposition or constitution. There was no freedom of speech or right to trial. Approximately 80% of Russians were serfs, peasants with no rights, freedom, or hope of betterment, their status passed down to their children. The inefficiency, not to mention injustice, of such a system was increasingly apparent even to many Russian aristocrats. In Europe, serving as officers in the Russian army, they'd visited countries where serfdom had been swept aside by war and revolution, and where monarchs had granted constitutions that limited their power, protected freedoms, and acknowledged the rule of law. It's got to be particularly annoying with Poland, right? You know, after the Napoleonic Wars, that's got to be like a particular thorn in the side of not just Alexander, because obviously it bothered Alexander, the kind of like quote unquote freedom that the Poles had. Um, but if you're a Russian who wants this change in Russia, the idea that Alexander would give it, even though his arms being twisted, the idea that Alexander would give it, at least in theory, to Poland has to be somewhat annoying. Many were inspired and began to dream of similar reforms in Russia. But few placed faith in Emperor Alexander to aid their cause. On the night of the 11th of March, 1801, Alexander's father, Emperor Paul, was strangled to death by a group of disaffected army officers. Alexander succeeded to the throne, aged just 23. The ineffectiveness and chaos of his father's rule had appalled him. In 1797, he'd written to his tutor, to speak plainly, the well-being of the state is not at all considered in the administration of affairs. There is only absolute power, which does everything wrong and at cross-purposes. The choice of officials is entirely a matter of favoritism. Merit counts for nothing. The farmer is plagued, commerce is hindered, personal liberty and well-being are reduced to nothing. There you have the picture of Russia. Judge how my heart must suffer. That is wild coming from Alexander. The young Alexander displayed a great enthusiasm for reform, an encouraging sign to Russian aristocrats who wished to see a more modern Russian state. In 1803, he passed a decree that gave landowners the right to free their serfs. Many hoped it was a first step towards the abolition of serfdom. In 1808, the brilliant and liberal-minded Mikhail Speransky became Alexander's chief advisor. He created a new council of state to advise the emperor, and even began working on a Russian constitution. But in 1812, Alexander's appetite for reform ended abruptly. First, an anti-reform faction, led by the emperor's sister, Grand Duchess Ekaterina Pavlovna, engineered Speransky's dismissal. Then, Napoleon invaded Russia. In this moment of supreme crisis, Alexander was seized by religious fervor, a sense of personal mission and national destiny. The burning of Moscow, he declared, had illuminated his soul. Liberal reforms, he could now see, were only the road to anarchy and chaos. They were an intolerable risk to Russia's holy institutions. In 1815, 
Any officers returning from Europe, harbouring hopes of reform, were to be severely disappointed. Alexander added insult to injury by granting a liberal constitution not to Russia, but to his new kingdom, Poland. Not one, it turned out, he planned to honour. Yeah, and again, he has his arm twisted on that, but still, if, you know, if you're pushing for this in Russia, that's bothersome. Three years later, when Alexander raised the possibility of a Russian constitution, based on this Polish experiment, it proved an empty promise. Idealistic young officers, more alienated than ever, decided that if the emperor would not take up their cause, they must act themselves. They began to organize secret societies and to plan a revolution. Many Russian military officers already belonged to a secret society. Freemasonry had been imported from Europe in the 18th century and was popular among army officers. Yeah, and there was actually, when I went to the Alamo, there was a plaque on the side of, <clears throat> I believe the convent, that was a Freemason plaque and basically it had a list of the people who fought and died at the Alamo that were Freemasons. It was a pretty common thing, especially for military officers at the time. I guess depending on where you are. But in 1816, officers from Russia's prestigious Guards regiments, based in St. Petersburg, formed a new secret society, the Union of Salvation. Four of its founding members would play a leading role in a revolutionary movement that became known as the Decemberists. Nikita Muravyov, a captain in the Guards Division staff, aged 31 at the time of the Decemberists' revolt. He would draft one of their major plans for constitutional reform. Lieutenant Colonel Sergei Muravyov Apostol, aged 30 at the time of the revolt. He would lead the Decemberist uprising in Ukraine. Colonel Prince Sergei Trubitskoy, aged 36 at the time of the revolt. A war hero from one of Russia's most distinguished families, Trubitskoy would be chosen to lead the Decemberist coup in St. Petersburg. And Colonel Pavel Pestel of the Vyatka Infantry Regiment, aged 33 at the time of the revolt. Also a decorated war hero, badly wounded at Borodino. He was a brilliant, if uncompromising, officer and one of the most active and radical members of the Union. He would argue for the Emperor's death and creation of a Russian Republic. Yeah, so this is, this is kind of a problem that you run into with these types of movements. You see this even with the US push for independence from Great Britain. Everybody wants, like, they have a common goal. However, they're all across not just the political spectrum, but what they actually want the end of, of this to, you know, to end up being. So for the, for the U.S. Revolution, you had people who absolutely did not want a push for independence. They wanted essentially a fair shake and more reasonable governance from uh, Britain, right? And then on the other side of that spectrum, you had people that were, no nope, outright independence, that's, that's what we want out of this, that's what this should be. And so you have to find a way to kind of find middle ground within these groups because they're, they're going to be people on, on all sides of this thing. The Union of Salvation soon merged with another secret society, the Order of Russian Knights, to form the Union of Prosperity, with more than 200 members. 
Its charter, known as the Green Book, set out how the Union was to be organised. It also spelled out its commitment to educating the public about Enlightenment ideals of virtuous, moral citizenship. This, it was hoped, would generate wider support for reform among Russia's elite. Only a trusted inner circle was privy to the Union's more radical, long-term goals of securing a constitution and ending serfdom. The leaders of the Union of Prosperity were wise to be wary. Alexander had tightened censorship laws, while allies kept him informed about Russia's supposedly secret societies. For the moment, he... You would think that with the... I don't know, the way that things had played out with czars of the past, especially the last couple of czars, that maybe you would, like, keep the people around you, the people that are, you know, in positions of power, at least power as it can be had in an autocracy, um, keep them happy. You know, it seems, I, I don't know, Alexander's a strange cat anyway, so maybe it's just the him thing. He tolerated them, telling one courtier, you, who have served me since the beginning of my reign, know that I have shared and encouraged all these dreams and delusions. It is not for me to be strict. His new closest advisor, General Alexei Arakchev, felt no such restraint. Arakchev had masterminded the organization of Russian artillery during the Napoleonic Wars, and was famed for ruthless efficiency, a violent temper, and absolute loyalty to the Emperor. He loathed almost anything to do with Western Europe. You don't get things done by talking softly in French, he once remarked. Arakchev was put in charge of the Emperor's latest idea, the so-called military settlements. The plan was to cut the cost of Russia's huge army by having soldiers and serfs live side by side in new villages organized like military camps with strict discipline. It was a harsh policy, even by the standards of Russian autocracy, and led to misery, riots, and rising resentment against the regime. Uh, again, you would think maybe you would like loosen a little bit with the way that, you know, the with everything that had happened to the last couple of czars, you would think maybe you would kind of learn and try to reevaluate things. But I guess not. Arakchev also enforced strict new standards of discipline and conduct in the army. The soldiers who had defeated Napoleon were now subjected to endless parades and inspections. Small infractions were brutally punished. Officers who spoke out on behalf of their men were dismissed. In 1820, a protest by the Semyonovsky Lifeguard Regiment, one of the army's senior units, led to even more savage punishments. To the Decembrist leaders, it proved that even elite regiments had fallen out of love with the regime. They themselves would be acting in a strong Russian tradition of palace coups led by army officers to secure dynastic and political change. Yeah, we'll do the uh, Peter and Catherine one at some point. That's a, that's a good story. The crucial task was to be ready when the moment came. By 1821, the number of new members joining the Union of Prosperity made its founders suspicious of infiltration and discovery. So they dissolved the Union. Its most trusted and committed members formed two new groups, 
each with around 20 to 30 members. The Northern Society was based in the Russian capital, St. Petersburg, and was initially the more moderate organization. The more radical Southern Society was based in Tolchin, Ukraine, where several Decembrist officers were stationed with their regiments. Both societies spent their time holding secret meetings at the apartments of their members. They would stay up late into the night discussing political ideas, reading aloud from banned literature, drafting manifestos and resolutions. The Northern Society adopted a draft constitution by Nikita Muravyov as its aims. His moderate document would make Russia a constitutional monarchy, but was otherwise heavily influenced by the US Constitution of 1787. He too called for a division of power between executive, legislature and judiciary, with each imposing checks and balances on the others. The executive was the emperor, supreme official of the Russian government, who would command the armed forces, lead foreign policy, and had the power to veto legislation. The legislature, a people's vietche, or assembly, composed of a supreme duma, or senate, and a house of representatives. Serfdom would be abolished, and there would be equality before the law. The right to vote would be restricted to those who owned a certain amount of property, thus ex Wow, sounds exactly like the setup for the US. Excluding the very poorest Russians. The Russian Empire was also to become a federal state of 15 regions, each with their own executives and assemblies. However, in 1823, a new member would take the Northern Society in a much more radical direction. 27-year-old Kondraty Relyev was another war veteran and a famous poet. He was passionate, eloquent, and devoted to the cause of revolution. He was known for his satire of the hated General Arakchev, secretly circulating amongst Russian liberals. All fear, tyrant, for evil and treachery, thou shalt be condemned by thy posterity. Relyev despised monarchy in all its forms. There are no good governments in the world, except in America, he declared. He proved a highly influential figure, and soon a radical wing of the Northern Society formed around him, taking up his argument for a Republican revolution. A friend described a meeting at his apartment around this time. There must have been more than a dozen people in the room, but at first I could not distinguish anything because of the dense blue haze of pipe and cigar smoke. They were sprawling on sofas and on the deep window sills. Young Alexander Odoyevsky and Bestuzhev sat cross-legged, Turkish fashion, on a Persian carpet. An intense youth with a pale complexion and prominent forehead lifts a glass. Death to the Tsar! The toast is received with emotion. Relyev's jet-black eyes light up with an inner flame. They sing to the death of the Tsar. The rhythmic chant flows through the open windows for all to hear. The leading figure of the Southern Society, based in Ukraine, was Colonel Pavel Pestel. He provided the group with its own constitution, Ruskaya Pravda, Russian Truth. Remember, he's the more extreme one, so my guess is this is going to be a more extreme, you know, version. And if I had to guess, I would say the emperor is not in this one at all. Remember on the last one for the Northern Society, they have him basically in the role of like president for the way it would be in the US. He's the head of the executive branch. My guess is he's going to be completely gone in this version. This lengthy, unfinished treatise was much more radical than Muravyov's constitution. There was no place for an emperor in Pestel's new Russia. 
the former supreme power has already sufficiently proved its hostile feelings towards the Russian people. The current order will cease to exist. Vestal called for a revolution, spearheaded by a provisional Supreme Council that would implement gradual but sweeping change. The two main needs for Russia are clear. A complete reorganisation of the state order and structure, and the publication of a completely new code of laws, while preserving everything that is useful, and destroying everything that is harmful. Serfdom would be abolished. Yeah, I don't know, sounds like maybe, uh, a Soviet. Land redistributed to the peasants, class privileges abolished, and the vote given to all Russian male citizens. The northern and southern societies remained in close contact, despite major differences of opinion between and within both societies. There was still much that bound them. All desired the abolition of serfdom and conscription, the end of autocratic government, the establishment of new rights and freedoms for the Russian people. What's more, they felt themselves to be in step with a spirit of the age, as revolutions and conspiracies spread across Europe in the name of liberty. Such events reaffirmed their conviction that change in Russia must come from direct action. Yeah, again, this liberal, um, you know, and, and move away from aut autocratic government kind of movements were just all over the place in this time period. Like, you know, they're, they're literally everywhere. And some of that has to do with, well, I guess a lot of it has to do with France, but some of it has to do with the Napoleonic Wars and Napoleon actually going through Europe and, and bringing these like quote unquote revolutionary changes. Um, but a lot of it is just kind of the thought process and ideas and, and stuff of the time. And having seen the new US, having seen the French Revolution, um, there's this major push for power in the hands of the masses. A coup d'etat, or revolution. In 1825, Pavel Pestel learned that the following spring, Emperor Alexander and his entourage would travel to Ukraine to inspect troops of the Second Army. Pestel formed a plan to assassinate the Emperor and launch a coup to establish a Russian Republic. The date was set, the 12th of March, 1826. After urgent communications with the Northern Society, Ryliev's faction agreed to launch a simultaneous uprising in the capital, St. Petersburg. But in December, unexpected news threw all their plans into disarray. That winter, Emperor Alexander visited southern Russia, where it was hoped the climate would improve his wife's frail health. Instead, Alexander himself became seriously ill. He died at Taganrog, aged 47. Typhus was the most likely cause. Alexander. What a wrench that has thrown into the plans for the revolutionaries. Like, your plan is to assassinate the emperor and launch a coup in the capital. And before you can, the emperor dies. And now you have this weird secession thing where, like, it kind of puts you on the back foot. What a, what a wild turn of events. A sudden death was a shock to all Russia. The Decembrists had agreed that the best time to force political change was at the succession of a new Tsar. Now was their moment. But no one was quite sure who the new Tsar was. Alexander had died without legitimate offspring. By the law of succession, he should have been succeeded by the eldest of his younger brothers, Grand Duke Constantine. 
but Constantine was terrified at the prospect of becoming emperor. I will be strangled, just as my father was strangled, he would say when the subject came. See, that's more the attitude that, like, makes sense to me. Not the one of, like, I'm the boss, I can do whatever I want. Like, seeing what has happened in the past, that attitude makes way more sense to me. Came up. So three years before his death, Alexander signed a secret document making his younger brother, Grand Duke Nicholas, his heir. But when Alexander suddenly died, the new order of succession was still secret, known only to a few members of the imperial family. All of Russia... Interesting. Interesting. So there was a secret agreement. And so they... Wow. So they really did not know who was going to be the next emperor. You know, some of the secession, succession stuff can get a little bit messy. And so I was talking more just like generally them like kind of having to wait for, you know, whoever's going to take the throne to like step up and go to coronation or something like that. But they actually don't know who it's going to be. Wow. Assumed Constantine was their new emperor. Yeah. Patriarchs, politicians, and troops swore new oaths of loyalty. Even Grand Duke Nicholas swore an oath, judging it better to observe the usual customs until Alexander's secret document could be made public. But Constantine, based in Warsaw in his role as commander-in-chief of the Polish army, had no intention of taking the throne. Nicholas urged his brother to come to St. Petersburg and publicly renounce the throne to end the confusion. Constantine refused. I cannot accept your request to come to St. Petersburg and warn you that I shall move even further away unless everything is settled in accordance with the will of our late sovereign. So he really, really does not want it to look like he is anywhere near the crown or throne. Meanwhile, the Decemberists in St. Petersburg were meeting daily. They had been caught off guard by Alexander's death, but the chaos of the Interregnum provides perfect cover for them. They recruit more officers to their cause, sound out the rank and file, work out who can be relied on and who cannot. Relief works without pause. All are fired with a wild enthusiasm. That December, Rumors, confusion, and fake news swirl around the Russian capital. You are fake news. Fake news. Fake news. Fake news. Fake news. Grand Duke Nicholas knows he is not popular with the troops. They regard him as another martinet, overly fond of inspections and parades. Now he is told that unknown army officers are actively conspiring against him. He decides to act first. In the early hours of the 14th of December, 1825, Nicholas declares himself Emperor of Russia. He will require an oath of loyalty that morning from all officials and troops in St. Peter. That is smart. That is smart. He's moving very, very quickly. He's trying to get the, the oath of loyalty as quickly as possible. He's trying to submit his position as quickly as possible. That was very smart. Petersburg. The Decemberists know that if the troops swear that oath, their cause is lost. There might not be another opportunity like this in decades. The 14th of December becomes do or die for the revolutionaries. And before the day is out, the streets of the Russian capital will run with blood. Man, that was great. Um, all right, that was part one of the Decemberists, who were Russia's first revolutionaries. Epic History does so, so great with these videos. Um, I will get part two out as quickly as I can. Um, I'm, I'm anxious to get into this too, so it'll be, it'll be pretty quick. But as always, like, comment, subscribe. Help me keep building the channel over here. I'll put the Discord link in the description box down below, and I'll see you all next time.